Okay. Um, so now let's start talking about the forensics outline. This is sort of a change from uh, the pre. This is sort of a change from just talking about web stuff. We're now going to be talking about forensic databases. Uh, forensic database analysis is slightly different. Basically, this is the case of where uh, you came across a database and you need to extract information out of it. So this could be something like you found a hard drive and you need to get data out of it. Or the other case is, is that your colleague uh, is leaving the company and, hey, I don't know how I, I got it, but uh, 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 here, but I don't, I don't have time to tell you all the features are in here, but here's a database, good luck. And that's the other type of case where you want to be able to know how to do this type of database analytical work. Um, out of curiosity, is there anyone here, how many people here are actually doing database type stuff? So there's a, so at least people are familiar with databases. This is sort of like a special exception. Uh, this is sort of a special case for that. Um, it's the, the main reason so we'll be talking about the, the databases log analysis and real-time web analysis and some caveats and questions. The, so we'll start right into this. Um, so um, the, one of the main reasons why we're going to be talking about forensic database analysis to begin with is that it's often overlooked that when you get a captured database, not every, everyone, or when you get a captured hard drive, it's not everyone's first inclination to look to see if there's any databases on the drive. Um, but if there are databases, SQL dump files, or other things, those are things which are very, that can be very valuable. So, um, it's something that, if you're familiar with, you should be able to get ready to use and exploit for intelligence purposes. Um, so, speaking of which, we're going to assume that uh, that we'll, we'll, the major caveat here is that we're going to be assuming that we're going to be able to. Um, uh, that this is going to be a copy of the data, not original evidence for people that care about uh, the specific forensic terms. We're not going to be talking about the original evidence. This is only for copies of the original evidence and not the original evidence. Because in, in certain cases, this means that you're allowed to have more freedom if you're dealing with non-original non data, so that way the auditing requirements are less. You can actually do stuff with the data as compared to the original forensic copy. And if that doesn't make any sense to you whatsoever, you can completely ignore it. Um, so yeah, I, the forensic database, I've done this for multiple sponsors. So this is one of those things that actually I wanted to really talk about which is why I've included this in the class, because not too many people actually are aware that this can happen. Just yep. so I can kind of get the context, is, is this one of the things that there's a, more than one MITRE research program on doing this? I'm thinking Mark Belaine has done this kind of stuff for my sponsor before. Um, Using something he came up with. I would be, I, I was unaware of him. I'd be happy to talk to him about it. Um, because I know that for you know other places for your sponsor um, that we've, we've, we've dealt with this before too. Now, I can talk with you later offline about okay. that a little bit more. But yeah, because this is something that for the type of sponsor you're dealing with explicitly, they have to do this type of stuff as well. Correct. Um, so. Uh, I'm doing it for a different sponsor, uh, and I'll, I can, basically what I did was I took all the lessons learned from your sponsor and created a new way, slightly a different, an improved way of doing it for my sponsor. I can, I'll talk to you later about that. 
Sound, sounds good? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. And yeah. So these these are all the best practices I've found for doing this so far. So that's the reason why I'm sharing this. Um, so the first thing, when you come across a database or frankly when you come across anything else forensically, you want to triage the data to look at the most important data sets first. Um, and you're going to assume here that you're going to be dealing with multiple data databases as compared to a single database uh, just because uh, that's the harder of the two cases. Um, so that uh, is, it provides for a bigger scope, I guess. Um, do these multiple databases have foreign keys? These, they do. Okay. They, That's your assumption. Is otherwise, it's, it, they just completely are orthogonal. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that they can. It, it's basically optional for them to have foreign keys. It's the way, because we're going to be talking about the, how we're going to be dealing with deleted rows here in a little bit. Basically, it's going to be optional for foreign key pairs to exist. Basically, what we're, because, sorry, one second, my brain resets. The, the, the foreign key aspect isn't the primary thing that we're, that we're going to be looking at. Basically, we'll extract the most meaningful portion of the information first compared to trying to create a perfectly harmonized database model. And uh, that allows us greater flexibility for searching. So, and so instead of having a perfectly defined database schema, it will be a little bit more, we, we can make it a little bit more custom to our application. Right, right. That was quite a tangent. I'm sorry. I was just trying to understand why you're saying multiple databases. Yeah. What, you know, what, what house would it matter? It's, it's because of the fact that on site I'm dealing with about 300 databases. So I'm trying to basically say, about every six months or so, we get on an average of anywhere from four to eight databases that come in. I need to find some way to integrate this into the overall search architecture that I develop. That's basically the full context of, of what I'm doing. Uh, and the reason why, and basically, you have to first look at the most important stuff in the database. For everything that, okay, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll continue going through the slides rather than staying on the slide. In case something's deleted, you can yeah. have those checks. There, there's a whole bunch of interesting things we can do, especially because not every data, database version is exactly the same. Um, so we're going to be, uh, we're going to be hosting and converting the databases from whatever character set it's in into Unicode. Um, the reason for that is because your search engines are generally geared to either dealing with a character set or Unicode, but it's, if you have multiple character sets, it's hard for the search engine to identify correctly what's being, what, what text needs to be searched. So, because of that, we're going to host the data and convert it all into Unicode. Um, we'll create the summary database of important fields from all databases. I'll talk about search tool suggestions and dealing with Murphy, where Murphy is Murphy's law. Um, so when we triage the databases, we want to make sure that we're looking at the most important databases first and the most important fields within that particular database. So uh, most important tables within that particular database for our given queries of choice. Uh, so 
if you were to look at the metro transit system or something like that, if they have tables for trains, but you're really interested more about the person about transactions that happen at individual turnstiles to get a flow of people behavior, you would probably want to not look at all the trains tables that are associated with the maintenance of the particular trains or something like that, the actual more of the financial aspect of when people enter and exit the train system. Something like that. Ooh. The mouse fell. Ooh, that was a loud noise. Okay. Um, so then at that point, uh, we want to host the data. Now, because it's unlikely that you're going to be able to ask someone why certain settings were used, um, we'll probably have to come up with techniques of being able to handle. Uh, uh, data that's coming in, uh, in, the, in uh, you'll, you'll have to figure out what the best settings are for you to host that data. So that in itself might be a little bit of a complicated process. They can come in in multiple flavors, they can come in multiple formats. The data could actually contain computer viruses as well. Um, so. You want to make sure that if you're going to be doing something large, large in scope, to be running this on an isolated network where you don't have to worry about viruses, because um, there may be times when uh, you care about all the rows in the database, and if one of the, one of the rows that aren't important contains a virus, that doesn't mean that table isn't important. It just means that particular row was closed, is damaged. So. You really need to uh, take that into a, to account somewhere within your application and not while you're importing the data into your given uh, environment. Um, importing data into MySQL is reasonably good. Uh, MySQL is a um, reasonably fast database. Now, the caveat I'll throw in is that uh, Oracle isn't putting a, hu a huge amount of support behind MySQL right now. So there's now actually an alternative uh, to MySQL, which was written by uh, the same person that created MySQL originally. Uh, and you can Google MySQL alternative. It'll tell you what the name of that, provision, that new database is, which I'm not calling off the top of my head. But for new projects, I would start using that. Um, so, uh, but it's basically was written by um, the original author of MySQL. They did a fork once Oracle bought the source code, and they're now doing improvements to that new fork. Um, okay, Maria. Yes, Maria. Uh, Maria, D. Maria D. B. is the is, a, is that new open source product database name for MySQL? What was that again? It's Maria D. B. Okay. Is the new name for uh, the MySQL fork, which is now open source as compared to the MySQL one, which Oracle owns. Um, and yeah, it's. The reason for MariaDB is basically the, is that the authors that originally wanted to work on MySQL, like they were afraid that when MySQL bought the source code, they weren't going to support it. And basically, since that's what's happening, they're now adding more features to the MariaDB instead of the MySQL database source line. Um, so, the other thing that's important when you're dealing with um, forensic database analysis or when you're dealing with other forensic stuff is to actually note where the data comes from, which sounds intuitive until you realize that if you don't do it, you can't tell where. You know that somewhere in the stack of hard drives you have a database that says this, but you don't really know where. So that's actually a important thing to make sure you attribute where each database actually comes from. Um, so the other thing you need to do 
is to back up the data because yes, original hard drives fail. And you know, this falls under the Murphy Law category, but definitely back up your data. Um, so after you get all that done, you want to attempt to host the data. Now, why we say attempt is because if you're given a, a database and you don't know where it came from, you don't really know what version of the database system they're using, so it may not work the first time that you try to import it. So you may need to do it multiple times until it actually works. Uh, also, um, if you're dealing with MySQL, MySQL on Linux or MariaDB on Linux is more forgiving than Windows, and I don't know why. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, <coughs> if you're going to be importing data or data files, the character set of the data may not be the character set your server is expecting. So that might be something you have to tweak before you can actually host the data. Um, you may need to repair tables that don't contain any rows because there might be times when that happens. Um, after you initially load the data, if you determine something is majorly wrong, you can start from your backup. Always have your backups of the original files and try again. Um, the other thing you need to be aware of is that MySQL requires uh, appropriate permissions to be set before you can look at the data. That basically means that the MySQL user in the MySQL group and own the actual individual database files and the 755 permissions for MySQL to actually work correctly. So that's, they're trivial things, but like there's times when you're importing files that may not work correctly. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, these things had happened. Um, when you're dealing with data that comes in from random places, you may not be able to make sense of it, but VI or strings is always a way of getting information out of data files you can't make sense of, so that's always an option. And that will actually work when trying to import out of random binary files or not. So it's, it works. Um, so we want people to convert the data and we want to convert the data to Unicode because of the searching issues that you would run in if, because my sense it just went, 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 went all together into one thought. Um, the reason why you want to uh, do that with, uh, to have a database of just Unicode characters is because most, most times uh, a, a, a database can only be in one particular character set, not in multiple character sets. So you can't actually host data from multiple databases in a, in a single uh, database character set. So what you want to do is um, basically first host the data just to make, just so you can see the data. After you host the data so you can see the data, you will then want to have a separate server which you, you convert it all over into Unicode. At that point, when it's converted into Unicode, you want to have a separate process which will basically take out the important fields and tables within the database and put that into something that makes sense. Where something makes sense is what you actually write your applications against. So um, it's, that's how I would do it and I'm currently doing it. Um, so if you're given a database and you don't know what character sets your data is in, if you can copy that your data into a text file, your browser will most likely be able to render it correctly. Just because web browsers need to be able to handle multiple different char multiple character sets. So 
if you set your browser to auto detect the character sets, which your which your to auto detect character sets, and you open a, a random file in a web browser, it should be able to identify uh, uh, what character set a particular particular file is in. And if that doesn't work, you have to remember that that uh, that data files can lie. So what I mean by lying is they can include an invalid header at the top of the file to say, hey, I'm in UTF-8, or hey, I'm in KY-8R, or I'm in this other character set of interest, but it actually, instead of what it says, it's actually in a different character set. And that actually happens a lot because web browsers can serve content and uh, thinking it's in UTF-8, but actually the person that was typing it entered it from a from a from a from like an Arabic keyboard or something like that. And while it will display correctly, regardless, the um, and the data can be stored in that original character set. The actual while the database will claim that's in UTF-8, it's actually not. It's actually just your Arabic character site stored as UTF-8 data. Does that make sense? It's, unfortunately, all these things are very complicated. Um, but that's basically what you need to do. And I also have more of a presentation that I had for. So if you, if you view the HTML, yes, wouldn't that be the correct? If you view the HTML the version of the text or the characters, if you view the HTML, it will display the non-interpreted version of, of the text. But the web browsers actually recognize different character sets. Okay, so there could be a bunch of junk that yes confuse translators. Yes. And so you have to manually select which one it is. Which unfortunately is, is a bit hard, but that's only really only the way to do it. Um, and if this is something you think you might be dealing with issues, uh, converting to Unicode and forensic applications is a presentation I gave to two departments ago uh, that, that I used to support. And that's a reasonably good starting point for that. After you get the data into Unicode database, um, at that point you can start prioritizing what you're importing and exporting from the database. So um, if you import the most important fields from your most important tables, but then you may wish to just throw everything else into a, to a text, uh, a full text search or something like that. That would allow you to be able to search most of the information the way that needs to be structured, but, but for the stuff that doesn't need to be structured, it will be full text searchable. Um, you shouldn't be afraid to create computed indexes based on this newly inputted, this newly created data. So you can create sound X searches for location searches or the other appropriate fields that uh, that might be secondary but important. Um, so that's that. So you can possibly recover deleted information from the database. Uh, so this is the XKCD comic, which is awesome. That, um, that someone tried to drop the table students from, from, from a school's database. Um, well, it may not actually be the end of the world because if you have a table like this where you have three students, Lisa, Bart, and Millhouse, and you have 
have them all take two quizzes, and Lisa gets two 100s, Mark gets 50 and a 75, and Millhouse gets it 78 and 50. That's actually a reasonably good profile for the individual users, and if they can produce either uh, another attribute that would actually tie them back to the original user. So if Bart na Bart's name is deleted, you could assume that, that his was the lowest grades in the class versus uh, Lisa's, which were the highest grades in the class. So it's not easy to do, but it might be possible to do that. Um, the other thing, too, to keep in mind is there actually was an evil virus uh, called Win32 Narolium, which actually was targeting database systems <coughs> by basically messing with foreign keys. So this really is the only type of analysis that you can do to restore the database to its original state. So that would be an interesting attack. Um, so I'll talk about search tool suggestions, and this is the type of stuff that I ended up doing for my sponsor. Um, you have to be able to search the data. If you, all, everything that is secondary, which is basically the properties of the data, can be sort of added to a list of things to get to after you can search the data. So you want to concentrate on the most important thing, which is searching the data as compared to searching all the secondary attributes, which may be nice to have, but are not important as the most important thing. Um, you want to also, instead of, you want to be, basically present a way of searching all of the data to have specific applications for the different types of data. So for instance, you may want them to be able to have insert a list of IP addresses for one query or a list of emails for another query, but have meaningful application responses or meaningful custom applications depending upon the type of data that they enter. That's uh, and what you can do is have a mailbox-like system. So think of your email inbox. And basically, when a search is performed, you have a query, you have a list of queries that need to run. And each time there's a meaningful result from one of the queries, they get an email back with the appropriate responses for that particular query. That's one way of doing um, being able to handle a bunch of, uh, handle a bunch of different types of data for a given search engine. It, it's, it's different, but it would work. Um, multiple servers are also a good thing because, they're, because each index that you create will probably be, have a different effect on the server. So you may, particularly for um, full text search engines, want to have possibly multiple um, servers for a particular search search index, excuse me. Um, the final recommendation is to uninstall mlocate. mlocate is just a utility to uh, on Linux to basically for you to type in locate and a file name and it will give you all the places where that file occurs. Um, depending on how you implement your search engine, you may have too many files for it to locate. So you may want to move that search utility. Just as sort of a good overall speed improvement for a particular box. Um, I've had a lot of issues with Mr. Murphy. Uh, there are uh, a lot of things that, particularly when you're dealing with a crisis, that you need to be aware of. So you want to make sure that power doesn't go off, affecting the whole system over a weekend. If there's, if there's loose wires, make sure to tape them down. Um, 
assume file systems, hard drives, CPUs will, will fail, you need to make sure that you have <coughs> some sort of backup available for you to be able to do work. Um, you need to be able to be, you need to allow for code to break, so having multiple instances on the server would maybe a good thing. Um, the final recommendation is don't short change development or staging environments because those development or staging environments are, the performance there is based to optimize production. So if you may be optimizing the wrong thing if you don't have a production environment which is similar to your de development environment. Um, the other thing you want to do is sanity check at multiple points in the, in the process. So basically have a testing mechanism in place to test for interesting things. So <clears throat> you want to make sure that your encodings make sense for a couple of rows in any given table before you push it to production. You want to verify through a web browser that things look okay. Um, because there will be times when, when you process stuff and, and it looks okay at first, but then you didn't uh, process it correctly for the whole, ta whole table uh, the same way. And that's okay if at least you looked at the table to begin with and the first couple of rows looked right. So at least you get some warm, fuzzy feeling first. You need to make sure that you have a warm, fuzzy feeling before you push data to the users. Um, the other thing you want to do is when you, you finish processing and you're about to update the server, have some, some sort of a sanity check uh, uh, script to go out and test stuff before you push to production if possible. Um, now, for all these things, it sort of depends on how, where you are uh, and when in, in, in a critical path. Because sometimes the first time you run a query, that may be the most important query you run all day. Uh, but if that's not immediately the case, you may want to try to optimize in other ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's basically you want to follow this principle, which is when you generalize, make sure you're generalizing the right thing. You don't want to generalize the wrong thing uh, because you, you don't want to optimize for a case that you don't need to, need to optimize for. And you want to make sure that the most, the data that you're looking for is actually what you're searching for. It's not it's not because the data is there that you need to import it into the appropriate field. Um, 